Chapter 4.8 deals with how art is often a very effective means of communication for a specific point of view on different social issues. Art has often been used to reflect upon historical, social, and political concerns, and artists often use their works to raise awareness and instigate change by activating very powerful emotional responses within their viewers. Um, art is often used to shine light on specific issues, um, maybe the injustices of slavery and colonialism, maybe artists too, their work, use their works to try to combat cruelty, poverty, or inequality. Um, so as we go through these examples and look at different ways that artists have um, tried to express their convictions through these artworks, um, keep in mind what they are protesting or what message they're trying to convey and see if you agree with their point of view or not. Now we've already seen this painting um, when discussing some of the formal elements and principles of art. Um, but now let's talk about it again in terms of how it memorializes on a very grand scale um, a rather scandalous event in French history. Um, so this is Theodore Jaripeau's Raft of the Medusa from 1819. Um, and so this is referencing an event that occurred on July 2nd, 1816. Um, the French naval vessel Medusa ran aground off the coast of West Africa. The captain and approximately 250 crew members boarded the lifeboats, but the rest of the passengers, about um, 146 to 150 people, um, were left on a makeshift raft that had been built from the wreckage. Now, initially, the lifeboats pulled the raft along, but the captain soon abandoned it. And so the survivors were left to battle starvation, sunburn, disease, dehydration. And in the end, only about 15 of them survived um, their, their time at sea. Um, some cannibalized their shipmates, and that was really the only way that they were able to survive. So Jericho's painting here really deals with the emotional intensity um, of the moment when the raft survivors are about to be rescued. Um, so if you remember, we discussed the um, implied diagonal lines that run sort of like an X through this composition. One of them leads us up to the right, and we see this tiny ship on the horizon, uh, giving us this sense of hope, perhaps. Um, that we will be rescued. And then the other implied line leads us from the bottom right to the top left over towards this um, large wave that could come crashing down on the raft at any moment, sort of implying this impending doom or this danger that is not yet passed. Um, so he uses the elements and principles to arrange his composition in a way that um, that really heightens the intensity or the drama of this moment and produces a stronger emotional uh, response within the viewer. Now, Jericho interviewed the survivors of this event. He studied the corpses and he even had a replica of the raft built within his studio to prepare for the painting. Now, the survivors told him all about the despair and the madness that they felt when they saw a ship on the horizon on the 13th day. Now, they had seen ships in the distance before, but um, the ship's crews had not seen men. And so many feared that this ship too would disappear. But the survivors, all close to death, were rescued and they told the world about how they had been abandoned by their captain. Um, <clears throat> so Jericho's painting here, it criticizes not only the disaster, not only the shipwreck of the Medusa, but colonialism and slavery. Only one African survived the tragic journey, and Jericho here has installed him as the heroic figure or the powerful figure at the top of the pyramid of people waving his shirt in the air trying to get the attention of the ship on the horizon. Um, so this event occurred during a time in which French or excuse me, France had colonial power over, um, well, 
a lot of a lot of areas in Africa, but um, here specifically, we're referring to um, what is now Senegal. So that was French Senegal at the time. So um, this man would have been from Senegal, and um, he was the only African to survive the journey. And Jericho, by making him the hero of this scene and and providing him with the opportunity to save all of these other people, he is, you know, criticizing colonial power in general and, and France's kind of imposition on Senegal and their other um, African lands. We also saw this um, work of art previously when we were discussing photography and photojournalism, which just as a reminder, photojournalism is the use of photography to tell a news story. Um, and so just to refresh your memory, the American photographer, Louis Wick Pine, um, he used photography to expose the injustices of child labor in the early 1900s. So he would go to factories and mines under the guise of a salesman or maybe a repairman, a safety investigator. Um, but then he would take photographs once he was inside and make detailed notes about the ages of the children that were working there. And then later he published his findings and the public was so shocked by the photographs of these children in their often very grueling and dangerous working conditions um, that his efforts eventually led to the establishment of laws preventing children from working at such young ages. So now let's look at contemporary Chinese artist Ai Weiwei. Um, he was born in 1957 and he has become internationally famous for his artworks that question the Chinese government's powers and the ways in which they function. Um, and he calls attention to the prices that he himself has had to pay for freedom of expression. Now, Ai Weiwei was raised in an activist family. His father was regarded as one of the finest modern Chinese poets, but he was imprisoned and exiled for opposing the Nationalist Party of China. We're going to watch a documentary about Ai Weiwei. Um, so you'll see several of these works of art and maybe hear some of the information um, repeated. But Ai Weiwei, um, he creates artworks that explore history, politics, traditions, um, freedom of expression, individual and human rights in China and globally. Um, and so he has, you know, over the course of his career, he has used different mediums and he has conveyed different messages. But I think he's a wonderful example of an artist who uses their platform for social justice or maybe just social change. According to Ai Weiwei, the act of changing the understanding and perspective of an object or reworking an established concept disrupts its stability and makes it questionable. Um, so we're looking here at three photographs. Um, this was a work that Ai Weiwei did in 1995 um, that consisted of him being photographed dropping a 2000 year old Chinese urn. Um, so this is a ceremonial urn from the Han Dynasty, which dates um, about 206 BCE to about 22 CE. And so the Han Dynasty is often considered the golden age of Chinese history. Um, and so the act of destruction and the photographic record here meant, were meant to um, be controversial in a way. Not only has he smashed an ancient artifact, but he doesn't seem to care at all. So this is a work that Ai Weiwei created after he returned to China in the mid 90s. He lived in New York City in 1981 to 1993. And then once he returned to China, he was rather shocked at the very rapid modernization and lack of regard for cultural patrimony that he encountered. Um, he explained that when he came across these Han Dynasty ceramic objects, they were just a dime a dozen. He said, quote, I still have a photo of when I was in Xi'an. There was a farmer sleeping on top of these two urns, waiting for someone to pay him a few hundred yen. Uh, for him, that was a month's, excuse me, for him, that was a few months' salary, but even then, nobody wanted them. 
Um, so he purchased a couple of these urns and he decided to deliberately break what he called cultural ready-mades. He's effectively tossing away the cultural heritage of China. Um, so the vessel itself becomes a symbol of Chinese history. And so he's questioning uh, who cultural values are created by and maybe who they're created for. And he's thinking about um, contemporary China and how the rapid industrialization has destroyed a lot of Chinese cultural heritage. He's thinking about memory and loss and the importance of the past. Um, potentially, it's unethical to destroy an artifact like this, and it does sort of indicate a lack of value or respect. Um, but according to the artist, his act was one of preservation through transformation, creation rather than destruction. He says, people always ask me, how could you drop it? But I say, it's a kind of love. At least there is a kind of attention to that piece because of the photograph. The power of the artwork comes not from the act, but from the audience's attention, the challenge to their values. The act is easy. Every day we drop something, but it is when we are forced to come face to face with this action and make a judgment that is the interesting part. In 2012, an exhibition titled According to What, held at the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden in Washington, D.C., um, was the first international survey of Ai Weiwei's career, and it brought together works from 1995 to 2010. And so in this image, you can see an installation of the dropping of Han Dynasty urn photographs from 1995, and then in front of those, another work titled Colored Vases from 2010. Um, putting these in the same visual space calls attention to the issues of consumerism and commodification, um, to appreciation and value, preservation and destruction, political commentary, and personal responsibility. In the earlier work, a single valuable urn or vase is shown and Contrary to how we might expect it to be treasured, it is willingly um, destroyed by the artist. Then in colored vases, um, we have these Han Dynasty vases, again, um, that may have been functional everyday items or maybe funerary objects when they were originally made. But now these painted vases become altered found objects and they take on a new significance as they're incorporated into Ai Weiwei's work. Um, the way that Ai Weiwei has dripped the paint onto each urn allows us to see um, the weathered surface of the ancient vessel underneath. And at the same time, it um, sort of foregrounds the artist's actions. Um, a tension is created in the work between the cultural artifact and the um, cheap, garish industrial paint that it has been dipped in. Um, not only do we have the past colliding with the present here, but the cultural tradition of the East is also needing an artistic individualism that is much more typical of the West. Um, the vase's presentation in a museum announces their status, and at the same time, the multiplicity of objects highlights the mass production, which can be traced back to at least about 3000 BCE in China. So ultimately, Ai's work leads us beyond the solitary and unified artwork into the space of the gallery and further into the realm of our own ideas and reflections and into the realm of history and culture as well. So here we have one more Han Dynasty urn. This time Wei Wei has painted the Coca-Cola logo across the front here. Um, so 
these Chinese ceramics that he is appropriating, these reference a very long standing tradition and an impressive history of significant technical innovations within Chinese history. Um, Chinese vases have traditionally been produced for utilitarian purposes or to be buried with the dead. Pottery from the Neolithic period, so from about 5000 to 2000 BCE, um, this pottery is notable for its painted decoration, and artists from the Shang Dynasty, which was 1600 to about 1046 BCE, uh, creatively developed a piece mold casting process. Uh, the Han Dynasty was notable for developing massive numbers of high quality ceramics uh, that were covered with a very low fired lead glaze. And so ceramic artists today still learn and use these once innovative but now traditional methods. Um, in fact, imitation of past styles is a part of the tradition of Chinese ceramics, which has led to the production of countless replicas. And so knowing this, Ai Weiwei's art leads us to consider whether such old objects should still be considered important if they can be reproduced almost identically. Further, are copies of ancient pots authentic works of art in their own right? Um, what if the uh, <clears throat> excuse me? <laughs> what if another artist comes back and alters the original object, like Ai Weiwei has done here? He's taken this ancient vase and painted the Coca-Cola logo across the front of it here. Um, now, this emblem is, of course. Um, iconic and recognizable pretty much worldwide. Um, and so he's sort of juxtaposing ideas of Western capitalist society with ideas of ancient Chinese craft traditions. Um, the familiarity of the Coca-Cola logo is a testament to the quiet yet relentless workings of globalization. Um, the Met Museum notes that the distinctive red lettering has penetrated into general consciousness enough to become almost invisible. It's an inescapable, immediate assertion of consumer culture, and its impact as a symbol not only of consumerism, but of wider popular culture has made it ripe for appropriation by artists. Um, from Ai Weiwei to Andy Warhol, the logo has um, been used as an exercise in iconoclasm. It's a mark of modernity, of America, and of a multinational market domination. For Ai Weiwei, it represents the tides of change and cultural conflict washing over his native China. And again, Ai Weiwei notes that by changing the meaning of the object, shaking its foundation, we are also changing our own condition and we can question what we are. Um, so ultimately, the questions that Ai Weiwei is raising within these works of art, they're not really meant to be definitively answered, but rather to trigger thoughts about the values of art and the ways in which we um, assign value to different works of art um, and who gets to decide and, and why. So in 2008, um, there was a very serious earthquake in Sichuan, China. Um, more than 69,000 people died and more than 4.8 million were left homeless. Um, now, during these earthquakes, many of the um, schools in Sichuan collapsed. Um, ultimately, 5,385 school children were trapped in the rubble and died. Now, Ai Weiwei and many others um, conducted an investigation of corruption within the construction of the schools that collapsed. They found that um, in order to save money or time, um, oftentimes the construction was quite shoddy. They cut corners and the buildings were not up to code. And so it wasn't necessarily a surprise that the buildings had not um, withstood the earthquakes. So 
this particular artwork is an installation on the facade of the Haus der Kunst Museum in Munich for a 2009 retrospective exhibition of Ai Weiwei's titled So Sorry. Uh, the title of the show is a reference to the apologies that are expressed by the government and by corporations when their negligence leads to tragedies as it had here. Um, so for this installation, which is titled Remembering, Ai Weiwei gathered 9,000 children's backpacks and installed them on, um, on the wall here. He said, the idea to use backpacks came from my visit to Sichuan after the earthquake in May of 2008. During the earthquake, many schools collapsed. Thousands of young students lost their lives, and you could see bags and study materials everywhere. Then you realize individual life, media, and the lives of the students are serving very different purposes. The lives of the students disappeared within the state propaganda, and very soon everybody will forget everything. Um, so in an effort to ensure that people don't forget this tragedy, he has created this work of art. So 9,000 children's backpacks, and he's arranged them so that they spell out a quote from a mother whose child died in the earthquake. Um, so in Chinese characters here, it says, she lived happily for seven years in this world. Now, two months before the opening of this exhibition in August 2009, um, Ai Weiwei went to Chengdu to testify for his friend Tan Zhurong. He was a fellow investigator of the shoddy construction and student casualties. And so on his way to testify, Ai Weiwei was grabbed by Chinese police and beaten so severely that he had to undergo emergency brain surgery uh, to stop the internal bleeding. Um, so this event will be addressed within the documentary that you watch um, and you'll get to see um, the experiences that he went through as well. We have Ai Weiwei's Sunflower Seeds from 2010. Um, this was an installation at the Tate Modern in the Turbine Hall. It consisted of more than 100 million tiny handmade porcelain sunflower seeds. Now, these are an allusion to the communist propaganda of Mao Zedong. If you remember, we talked about him in a previous lecture, um, but he considered himself the sun and the citizens of the People's Republic of China as sunflowers. Now, sunflowers, when they are um, fully grown, they will turn to face the sun, regardless of where it is in the sky, so that they are receiving full sunlight. So he he, uh, Mao Zedong was implying that the people of China should turn toward him and look to him for guidance and kind of leadership no matter what. Um, also, however, sunflower seeds were eaten even in the poorest parts of China during Ai Weiwei's childhood during the Cultural Revolution of Mao Zedong. Um, and so even the poorest people could afford sunflower seeds. And in several interviews and things, Ai Weiwei discusses, um, you know, he remembers his childhood being rather, rather poor and difficult, but he also remembers always having a pocket of sunflower seeds. Um, and that was sort of his little snack and also his, his pleasure um, for the day. Um, he also discusses how in many parts of China, a lot of adults, Chinese people will have um, sort of a chip in one of their front teeth from cracking open sunflower seeds. That's how frequently they ate them. So these porcelain seeds were carefully made by more than 1600 artisans using molds and then hand painting them. Now, Ai Weiwei went to Jingdezhen, the porcelain capital of China um, and really of the world. Artists here have been producing pottery for more than 200 years, all the way back to the Han Dynasty. Um, this is where porcelain was originally invented and really porcelain is a symbol of Chinese culture. Um, so he hired artisans um, from Jingdezhen to produce these porcelain sunflower seeds as a way to connect to Chinese heritage and artistic traditions.
<clears throat> so on April 3rd, 2011, Ai Weiwei was arrested while waiting for a flight to Hong Kong from Beijing. Now, this detention was broadly believed to be linked to his criticisms of the Chinese government. Um, just a few months prior to his arrest in February of 2011, um, a, a series of peaceful protests around China were led by another person, Jasmine Reyes, and I believe Ai Weiwei um, sort of spoke out in support of these peaceful protests, and then the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs declared him to be under investigation for alleged economic crimes, um, but that was probably not true. Um, However, the government destroyed his studio while he was imprisoned for several months. Um, this will be covered in the documentary, so you'll get to see some more details about that as well. In more recent years, Ai Weiwei has focused his practice on advocating for refugees' human rights. Um, he documents the experiences and conditions that millions of people who have been forcibly displaced from their homes are undergoing every day. Um, so this particular installation, Soleil Levant, from 2017, this is um, another installation at, let's see, this one is at the Konzerfaus Museum in Berlin. Um, so this consists of 14,000 life jackets installed um, on the six columns of the facade of the Berlin Concert Hall. Excuse me, I think I said museum a moment ago. Um, but Ai Weiwei collected these life jackets on the island of Lesbos, um, just off of Greece. And this island has often been used by Syrian refugees en route to Europe. Um, and so each life vest reflects the individual life of a man, woman, or child whose landing at Lesbos is just the beginning of their new life. Um, and so he's bringing attention to the refugee crisis and highlighting the countless lives that have been changed by it. Um, he said, there is no refugee crisis, only a human crisis. In dealing with ref refugees, we've lost our very basic values. In this time of uncertainty, we need more tolerance, compassion, and trust for each other. Since we are all one, otherwise humanity will face an even bigger crisis. Um, here is another angle, the same building, but now we're looking at the side. And so it has these faux kind of um, arched windows that he has also filled um, with additional life jackets. So no matter what side of the building you're on, you can see um, part of this installation. Um, and here we have a work titled Law of the Journey. Now this was installed at the um, 2018 Sydney Biennial. Um, this was a 60-foot inflatable boat crowned with hundreds of anonymous refugee figures, um, and it sort of brings the monumental scale of this humanitarian crisis um, or the refugee crisis into focus. Now, this is created with the same black rubber um, and fabricated by the same factory that produces these little rubber lifeboats that are used by thousands of refugees attempting to cross the Mediterranean Sea. Um, now, the wallpaper in the room, um, he used photographs that he had taken on his iPhone while he was making a documentary in 2017 titled Human Flow. This documentary explores the refugee crisis on a global scale. Um, he moves beyond Syria and Europe and looks at Africa. He looks at South America and um, countless other regions as well. It's on Amazon Prime, I believe, if you're interested. I would definitely um, definitely encourage you to go watch it. But he also, at this particular um, exhibition, he played four video works um, that showed um, an overcrowded, inflatable raft delivering a constant flow of people to the shores of the Greek island of Lesbos. Um, they also show Ai Weiwei standing alone on a partially submerged inflatable vessel, uh, which was discovered floating in the Mediterranean, and the fates of its passengers remained unknown. Um, another video showed footage of the same raft abandoned to the seemingly limitless expanse of the ocean. 
Um, and then he also created a documentary film titled Ai Weiwei Drifting that follows Ai Weiwei over the course of one year um, as he created a series of works focusing on the refugee crisis. Okay, so now we have another artist. This is Pedro Reyes, and this is a work he began in 2007, but is still working on today. Um, and this is titled Guns for Shovels. So in an effort to create social participation in combat against the high number of violent deaths in Mexico City, um, Reyes created this public campaign in which the public donates firearms that are then melted down to make shovels. Um, so then Reyes took those shovels and planted 1,527 trees around the world, which was equal to the number of guns that were originally donated to him. Now, many of these shovels have been exhibited in galleries to raise awareness of the scale of the Mexican weapons trade. And then he continues to use donated guns as his medium. And he transforms these weapons from vehicles of violence to objects that can contribute to society. So tools like these shovels or just works of art in general, maybe musical instruments, um, things that will better the community around them. Uh, here we have the Iranian artist Shirin Meshat. Um, she was born in 1957 and then moved to the United States in 1974. She returned to Iran the first time in 1993, and she found her country had been transformed by the fundamentalist regime that came to power after the 1979 Islamic Revolution. Um, at this time, she began creating these poetic photographs and films that explore the complicated realities of gender, religion, and cultural difference. So from 1993 to 1997, she did this series titled Women of Allah. Um, and so in it, she seeks to expose Western stereotypes about Muslim women. Um, she's sort of claiming that their identities are much more varied and complex than what is generally assumed. Um, this particular photo from that series is titled Rebellious Silence. Um, we have a black and white photo of a woman wearing a traditional shador. Um, and then Nashat has written across her exposed face in um, Farsi in this kind of beautiful, delicate calligraphic script. Um, some text taken from um, the writings of a 20th century Iranian female author and poet. Um, now, the woman holds a rifle barrel, which vertically splits her face and the composition in half. Um, and so we have the veil, we have the words and the gun that all separate us from this woman. Um, these maybe serve to protect her from the outside, but they're also meant to show how little we truly understand her. Um, here are a few other photos um, from Nishat's series. Um, and so oftentimes there is this seemingly contradictory perception of Muslim women in Western society. They're often viewed as somehow being both suppressed or oppressed victims, but also fierce, dangerous soldiers of the Islamic faith to be feared. Um, and so Nishat is sort of confronting these stereotypes and these perceptions um, and challenging the viewer to rethink the ways in which we perceive Islamic women. Uh, so here we have a work that is perhaps somewhat similar. Um, this is the work of two French artists, J.R. and Marco, and together they create the group 28 Millimeters. This particular work is titled Face to Face, and it's from 2007. Um, and so within this work, they took photographs of Israeli and Palestinian people who held the same roles within society. Um, so they took photos of doctors, teachers, etc., and um, then they hung large images on the West Bank wall that divides Palestine from Israel. 
So oftentimes the photographs of the Israeli and Palestinian people show um, expressive, kind of playful, universal emotions like this. Um, and so it's sort of asking the viewers to consider the differences between the two groups. Um, residents on either side of the wall were quite entertained and intrigued by these photographs. And generally, they couldn't tell who was Israeli and who was Palestinian. And so the goal here was to sort of highlight the similarities of the two groups and enable them to view each other as actual people instead of stereotypes. In 2017, JR did an installation at the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, you know, he's thinking about borders and the arbitrariness of them and how oftentimes lives have been lost because of them. And so he has installed this very large scale mural. It's about 65 feet tall of a one year old Mexican baby um, sort of peering over the border wall here. Now, this had been planned for a while, but um, it actually ended up being installed pretty soon after um, Trump had announced his plan to end DACA. Um, and it remained um, it remained up for one month and on the very last day. JR and his team hosted a picnic across the border. Um, so on the US side, there were tables. On the Mexico side, there were blankets. And this was meant to call attention uh, to economic disparities. Um, he included a photograph of DACA dreamer Myra's eyes. Her parents had entered the US illegally, but she was a DACA dreamer. And so um, he's sort of breached the barrier or the boundary with her eyes here. Um, people on both sides of the border were served the same foods. They heard the same music played by a band that was also split by the wall. Um, so sort of thinking about, again, how arbitrary borders often are, the only thing that is really separating these two groups of people is the border wall. Um, and without it, would we even know the border was truly there? Um, this artist, Cheryl Rowland, this is his jumpsuit project, which he started in 2016. Um, he was a graduate student at UNC in 2013 when he was wrongfully arrested and imprisoned for more than 10 months. Um, and so he does this performance piece in which he just goes about his daily activities while wearing his orange prison jumpsuit. Um, so this act alters all of his interactions with other people, just the same as being in jail had altered his interactions. Um, he says that the jumpsuit triggers conversations about the prevalence and impact of false incarceration, especially for black males in America. Um, and so his goal is to raise awareness. He says incarceration happens every day. It could be anybody. It could be me today, but it could be you tomorrow. The Guerrilla Girls are a collective that came into being in 1985. So at the time, the Museum of Modern Art hosted an exhibition titled The International Survey of Contemporary Painting and Sculpture. Um, this exhibition included more than 170 artists. However, most of these artists were white and less than 10% of them were women. Uh, so in response to this, a group of feminist artists um, critics, historians, etc. 
they got together and formed this activist group that would function as, quote, the conscience of the art world. And so the Guerrilla Girls as a group was born. Um, they sought to expose both gender and racial inequalities within the art world, um, to stand against discrimination and to fight for the rights of um, both female artists and artists of color. Now, the members of the group wanted to remain anonymous, so they often take on um, the names of dead female artists as pseudonyms. And to hide their identities, they wore gorilla masks out in public. Now, notice that the name of the group, Gorilla Girls, is not spelled like Gorilla the Animal, um, but rather Gorilla, as in Gorilla Warfare. Um, now, Gorilla Warfare tactics involve covertly striking at your enemy quickly before they realize what's happening. Um, and so they took on this name because that's sort of how they saw um, their own tactics. They used these sharp, witty posters and kind of, um, you know, biting humor to strike out at their enemies here. And so the gorilla mask is somewhat of a play on words. Um, <clears throat> in terms of design, they sort of draw from advertising. Um, this particular work, do women have to be naked to get into the Met Museum? Um, so the figure here, they have lifted a female nude figure from um, a very famous Roman, uh, excuse me, a very famous romantic painting um, by the artist Ang titled The Grand Odalisque. And then they have placed, of course, their signature gorilla mask on um, the female figure. But um, they did a survey um, and found that less than 5% of the artists in the Met's modern art collection were women. However, 85% of the nudes in the collection were female figures. Um, and so they created this poster to draw attention to this problem in hopes that they could bring about some kind of reform. Um, they apparently repeated this survey in 2005. Um, the number of female artists in the collection had only increased by 3%, but one of the members of the group noted that, quote, at least there were more naked men. And one more from 1989, you're seeing less than half the picture without the vision of women artists and artists of color. In 1981, AIDS was declared a global pandemic. And by 1994, it was the leading cause of death among all Americans ages 25 to 44. Now there was a lot of misinformation and paranoia um, going around about the disease and the disproportionate impact that AIDS had on the gay community um, combined with pre-existing stigmas led to a general disregard for the seriousness of the disease. And so many artists adapted activist strategies to educate the public and call for action. So here we're looking at a work by Grand Fury. Um, this is an art collective that made works for ACT UP, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. Uh, this particular work is titled Silence Equals Death. Um, so this was a sort of logo that um, this activist group made in various mediums. This particular one happens to be a neon sign. 
Um, but we have um, sort of easy to read text that communicates a pretty clear message. Um, and then the pink triangle. So apparently the pink triangle was used by Nazis to identify gay men um, in, con in conversion camps, excuse me. And so during this period of time, many, um, many gay individuals and many artists uh, reclaimed the symbol as a symbol of gay rights and a symbol of pride. And so they incorporate it into many artworks that are trying to raise awareness about the AIDS crisis. Here we have another artist exploring this idea. This is Keith Herring's Ignorance Equals Death from 1989. Um, Herring who was always interested in social activism and he turned a critical eye to numerous subjects that were on people's minds in the 1980s. And so HIV and AIDS and LGBTQ rights are just one of the many topics that he covered. Um, notice that he incorporates um, the same phrase as the previous work by Grand Fury, silence equals death. He also incorporates that neon pink triangle and fight AIDS, act up, um, the coalition to unleash power, the same group that we just looked at a moment ago. Um, typically, you know, Keith Herring's drawings included some words, but not very many. Um, and these do reflect his political beliefs, but the symbolism that he employed uh, really made his feelings about the subjects transparent. Um, Uh, here you can see Herring standing next to his famous Crack is Whack mural in New York in 1986. Uh, the crack epidemic was also um, a big topic during the 80s and 90s. And so here he has um, kind of incorporated, you know, simple figures kind of piling. We can see um, drug paraphernalia. We can see flames kind of eating away at this dollar bill, except it's not worth a dollar. It's worth nothing. Um, and these skeletons all beneath his sort of simple and catchy um, phrase here. And then here you can see Keith Herring. Um, he's at an in apartheid rally in Central Park in New York City of 1985. Um, so he designed these posters. Uh, the text across the bottom there says free South Africa to um, protest the South African apartheid. And so at this particular rally, he, he designed the poster, he printed out numerous copies. You can see that he made a t-shirt as well. Um, but then he's handing out all of these posters to the various um, attendees at the rally um, for them to use while they march.
One of these artists was Willie Bester. Um, he was born in 1956, and his past book classified him as colored. Um, his mother was also classified as colored, and his father was um, his father was of Zhokso heritage, so he was black. Um, but his parents were therefore in an interracial marriage, and that caused a lot of um, difficulties for them. They had trouble finding, um, you know, neighborhoods that they could live in, things like that. Um, now, Willie Bester showed an early affinity for art. He had very little official training, but he made toys from scraps, um, and he drew from a very young age. In the 1980s, um, the community arts program in Cape Town, he started taking classes there, and he started making what is called township art. So townships were very, um, very poor neighborhoods that were um, set up for black South Africans. They were often very dirty. They didn't have running water or plumbing. Um, and township artists made artworks that reflected the realities of um, living within these places. And so oftentimes he created assemblages and sculptures using found objects and oil paint. Um, and these become rather dense retellings of the oppression, the injustice, and the deprivation that these Black South Africans are experiencing. So this particular work is titled Simikazi. It comes from a series that Willie Bester did in the 90s titled Migrant Miseries. Um, and so this is an assemblage that tells the story of a gentle, devout man from the Crossroads Township outside of Cape Town. Um, and the man's name is Simikazi. Now, he was an older man who rented a bed that was really his only personal space um, and that, you know, was within a house full of other people. And so um, Willie Bester was very moved by the experiences that Simikazi had undergone. Um, when he met him, as I said, he was an older man, and he had apparently recently found out that despite having worked for the same employer for many, many years, they were not going to give him his pension because according to a government listing, he was already dead. So because of the government's mistake, um, this man was essentially not going to receive his retirement funds. Um, now, I mentioned he rented a bed that was his only kind of private or personal space. Um, so notice in the center of this composition, we have um, sort of a bed spring that has been attached and oriented vertically so that it sort of looks like maybe um, maybe like uh, a cage or a prison door. And so from behind that door, we can see the face of Simikaze kind of peering out from between the bars. Um, and so this sort of speaks to the ways in which he's kind of trapped within this situation. Um, to the right of his portrait, uh, Willie Bester has included Simikaze's passbook, the ID that he was forced to carry everywhere. Um, and then he's also included other portraits of Simikazi's wife and children. Um, his wife and children lived elsewhere, and he only got to visit them for about three weeks each year. Um, he also includes wire, a bike wheel, and bits of trash to refer to Simikazi's job as a trash picker. Um, and then in the upper right corner, he includes text from a handwritten note of Simikazi's discussing his employer not giving him his pension money because he was already listed as being dead. Um, so the intensity of this kind of packed, garbage-covered surface is meant to communicate the artist's rage at the way that Simikazi was being treated by his employer and by society in general. Unfortunately, Simikazi was murdered just six months after Willie Bester finished this work. Here we have another of Willie Bester's works. This one is a tribute to the apartheid activist 
Steve Biko. Um, again, this is a collage or an assemblage created with found objects um, from the townships that are quite rich in symbolic meaning. Um, so on August 18, 1977, Steve Biko, who was already a relatively well-known activist against the apartheid regime, um, but he was arrested at a police roadblock. Um, so notice on the left side of the canvas here, uh, Bester has incorporated a stop sign into the collage to reference uh, this particular event. Um, but after his arrest, he was interrogated and tortured by officers for 22 hours in police room 619. Um, he sustained head injuries that put him in a coma. And while he was in the coma, the officers loaded him into a police van and transported him over 700 miles to a prison in Pretoria. Um, he died September 12th, 1977, naked and shackled in his cell. Now, the police claimed that his death was the result of a hunger strike that he was willingly undergoing but his autopsy revealed multiple bruises and abrasions and that he ultimately succumbed to a brain hemorrhage from the massive injuries to his head. And many saw this as strong evidence that he had been brutally clubbed by his captors. And so since this, uh, Steve Biko has been seen as sort of a martyr of the anti-apartheid movement and his death really served as a rallying point against the apartheid both locally and nationally. And so Willie Bester here is uh, commemorating this man and his, you know, his attempts to stand against the apartheid um, government, but he's also calling attention to the atrocities and the tragedies um, that this man was subjected to. So we have a portrait of Biko in the center. His hands have been shackled together and he stands in front of a crowd of um, sort of stylized figures. They seem to look sort of like skeletons. Um, and then there are crosses all across the background. Again, the stop sign on the left side. And then just above that, you can see the police van that he was loaded into. And um, just to the side of it, there's a street sign uh, that says 1,100 kilometers to Pretoria, which he's also repeated the phrase um, across the top of the painting there. Um, then notice on the right side of the painting, we have um, sort of a metal door that he has included, and it has been labeled Room 619, which is where he was held and beaten. Um, so again, the sort of densely compacted, chaotic surface of the work of art is meant to um, kind of symbolize different points in this narrative and call attention to the ways in which the apartheid was oppressing and um, sort of abusing Black South African people. Uh, here we have Gavin Johantis. This artist was born in 1948 in Cape Town, um, but he later left to study art in Germany in 1970. Um, and then in 1974, he produced his South African coloring book. Now, this was a series of 11 silkscreen prints with images and text um, sort of done in the guise of a child's coloring book. And he chronicles the race classifications, the conflicts and the exploitations of the apartheid. Um, here he's used personal materials like his own identity pass card, which classified him as being cape colored. Um, but he's also incorporated other photographs and um, and materials from this era. Um, he includes scenes of South African life in the mid 1970s, including images of the Sharpville massacre with a text that says color these people dead um, and an image of a woman scrubbing the floor with text that says color this labor dirt cheap um, and an image of gold mines saying color this slavery golden. Um, and so he uses sort of stenciled palettes to overlay the text across the imagery. Um, and he's using kind of blocks of color, maybe mimicking um, print media as well. Um, but 
Jahantas really tried to emphasize that history is central to culture and that African art has always been dependent on a wider cultural excuse me, wider cultural and political sphere. He said, African works of art appear meaningless unless seen in relation to Africa's cultural and historic reality. Um, the environments of today's Africa demand liberation from inhumanity. Can the art of Africa ignore this demand? Can it be anything else than art for liberation's sake? He said that his goal with this project was to speak and be heard in what he called the dominating colonial culture of silence in which the oppressed peoples had no voice. In 1978, he wrote, the coloring book project was my first step out of the culture of silence, and it is therefore dedicated to all of those struggling for humanity and equal rights. So this particular work by the artist Chris Jordan is from a series titled Running the Numbers 2, Portraits of Global Mass Culture. Um, this is a series he did in 2009, and this particular work is titled Gear. And so it might look a little bit familiar to you because he's using Hokusai's great wave off the shore at Kanagawa to sort of highlight the idea of consumer waste. He has used 2.4 million pieces of plastic to reflect the number of pounds of plastic that are estimated to enter into the world's oceans every hour. Um, the plastic he used was collected from the Pacific Ocean, and he's named the work after the Pacific Gear, which is a 1,000 mile wide whirlpool which collects a huge amount of trash. Um, so he's trying to draw attention to the huge volumes of waste that humans create as a whole, but to also bring it to a more individualized level. Um, and he does this by incorporating familiar objects like toothbrushes, combs, etc. Um, now, Hokusai's original work is meant to emphasize the beauty and power of nature. Um, and here, Jordan references that to ask the viewer to consider whether or not that beauty and power can survive um, with the environmental issues that we have created. Um, the artist says, quote, the pervasiveness of our consumerism holds a seductive kind of mob mentality. Collectively, we are committing a vast and unsustainable act of taking, but we each are anonymous and no one is in charge or accountable for the consequences. I am appalled by these scenes and yet also drawn into them with awe and fascination. I find evidence of a slow motion apocalypse in progress. Fabrice Montero is a photographer and visual artist who is originally from the Republic of Benin, but lives and works in Dakar, Senegal. Um, and in 2013, he began a project uh, called The Prophecy um, to raise awareness in the local population of the serious environmental scourges that the country was suffering. And a raise awareness for the consequences of excessive consumption. Um, Montiero creates characters that emerge from oil slicks, garbage dumps, and dry landscapes, um, and then photographs them to deliver a warning and to um, give a sort of empowering message to humanity. Now, the colorful series of photographs unquestionably awakens the collective consciousness and his goal is to continue his project around the world and thus involve all cultures and continents in a dialogue on a global scale. 
He worked with fashion designer Ja Gall um, to create the outfits for these characters. Um, this one is in a landfill and the figure is sort of rising out of a skirt made of trash looking out over the landscape um, and she is surrounded by this dark hazy smoke that is pluming up from the piles of trash that are being burned. Here's one where the figure is covered in nets that have been discarded in the ocean. So thinking about how um, wildlife often becomes trapped in these nets or just is um, subjected to the pollution that we put in the ocean every day. Uh, notice that the figure holds a shield made out of a sea turtle shell and has oiled feathers on her head. Here's one about slash and burn agriculture. Um, so we have um, fires burning in the background and our figure has been transformed into almost an allegorical figure, um, kind of a personification of the earth and of the trees. Um, and so speaking out against practices like these. Uh, and here are a couple more. One on the left about um, oil spills and pollution. We have a half sunken tanker in the background and a figure with water bird feathers and oil dripping off. Um, and then on the right, one about air pollution with this large um, construction vehicle or maybe just a, a large dump truck here. Um, kicking up dust and emitting fumes into the atmosphere, uh, kind of choking out the citizens that are walking on the street beside.